Hello and welcome to the program. At this point, I want to encourage you. You're going to hear things that will bless you, that will fire you up in ministry. And I want to encourage you to get on the telephone. Tell a friend, tell a relative, tell a pastor to tune in now because I have in the studio with me a wonderful man of God by the name Pastor David Richman Olayinka of a ministry known as the Powerhouse International. Welcome to the program, sir. Thank you so much, sir. It's great to have you here with us in the studio, yes. and I really thank God for your life. Thank you. Bob. I know we've done an interview before, which, I'll, I, on the, which is on the uh, Pastor's Corner, which I'll encourage so many of you to go check out on our website and watch. The man of God is dynamic. Last time you shared with us, you know, how you came out of Islam into Christianity. And it seems like I, I, I get warmed up when I meet fellow ex-Muslims. You know, because I know it takes a lot to get out of that religion into Christianity. And you must have an encounter to really leave Islam. So can you in a nutshell tell us what happened? Yeah, like I said the other time, um, and like you were saying, it takes a lot to come out of Islam. It's not something that you will come from, I mean, come out of, you know, just that easily. It takes God to come out of it. Um, God is so merciful you know, and has been trailing me since I entered into the primary school, you know, and in the primary school they teach also uh, religious knowledge, Christian religious knowledge. So, but prior to this, I've been learning about Islam, and then they began to talk about Jesus, talk about Joseph, talk about the miracles in the Bible, and the Bible stories were very fascinating. Wow. So it's the fascination of the Bible story that stirred up my curiosity. So I began to listen more. And then before you say, Jack, God has already taken a hold of my heart. My heart was already taken a hold of before I was 10 years old. Wow. But I only gave my life to Jesus at around between 17 and 18 after finishing secondary school. God took almost about 10 years explaining things to me. So when I shifted over to Christianity, nobody could push me over, even with many persecutions from my dad, from my family, from everybody, because God has taken time to fund it me for those 10 years. Wow. Yeah. Man, I thank God for your life. I know one of these days we're going to talk in full about how you converted and the persecution that came along, which is just normal yeah. to a lot of us who came from an Islamic background. But you are the pastor of the Powerhouse Church in Galway in Ireland. My God's grace. Tell us about this church. What is it about this church? Because I know we have so many viewers from Ireland. Yeah. They're looking for a church to go to. Some of them have spiritual attacks every day. They need deliverance. And we refer them to some ministry that doesn't even have branches in Ireland. Tell us about uh, the Powerhouse. Yeah, the Powerhouse International is a church that is centered on eternity centered on the kingdom of God and everything that has to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ, pure. As a matter of fact, somebody called me from Nigeria one time and said he's been following our ministry very secretly and they didn't let me know. He said, you guys are too sincere to be a ministry. <laughs> everything is transparent. Too sincere you know, to be a ministry. Yeah, because when I got converted to Christianity, one of the things that God dealt with me about is being transparent being natural, being sincere. So, and I take the Bible from the face value. That whatever I see in the Bible, that's the way we practice it. There is nothing, there's no ulterior motive behind it. So that's, that's the way we operate in wow. our, with our church and our ministry. But then, you know, if, like you said, even a lot of Christians, they struggle with you. They don't see, they find it difficult to believe you are open. You are transparent. So they think there must be something else. Yeah. Why is this guy always happy? Yeah. Why is he always so straightforward? Like, like, one, guy, like they... one guy that has moved to uh, Manchester now. He's been following me since around 2014. He's a Muslim guy before getting converted to Christianity. And he said, I've been watching you over the years. And I've been trying to think of what would be the reason why you're so committed to all of us and doing all these things you're doing. There must be some reason behind it. There must be something you want to accomplish. Because his mother came with an imam one day, and then the imam said, you're too good for the young people. They're following you. Their lives are changing. There must be some reasons behind it. I said, there's no reason. The only reason is eternity. Because this is what I tell people. 
My own ministry is all about my going to heaven. That's the most important part. That's the most important uh, part of my ministry, that I'm on my way to heaven. Then the second part of it is bringing along as many people as possible. Because without Jesus in eternity, eternity is in hellfire. Wow. <laughs> God bless you, sir. My, I know we're going to do a lot of programs together concerning eternity and all these things you're sharing. Because I, I, there are, you know, Muslims who are watching, a lot of them are not in this kingdom yet because they look at the lives of so many Christians yeah. and they wonder, these people are not real. Yeah. We just met a Muslim just before we came in here. Yeah. And he was explaining to me, he said, he said he's met so many Christians. He said they're not sincere. That, not straightforward. That's the reason why as many of us that are sincere enough, you know, we just keep praying into the atmosphere. Because I discovered that before I got born again also, I observed that the life of a lot of Christians that I was saying was not what, I knew that the, that was not what Christianity was all about. But nonetheless, God still got me. Amen. Hallelujah. So God has a way of getting the people that he needs to get. Wow. You know, you know I, I thank God for your life because, you know, you said God took hold of you at the ripe age of 17, just like uh, Joseph. Yeah. And since then, you never looked back. You know, you've been in ministry for so long, but what can you share? What do you think is needed for any Christians to have longevity on this journey? It's, it's very simple. Jesus was only could figure about it. You know, Matthew 18, 3, except you be converted, and be like little children, you will in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. It takes being a child. God will not have you become an adult. The problem is that as soon as people begins to, begin to experience some form of God's um, grace, then they become adults in Christ Jesus. God doesn't want us to become adults. He wants us to remain children. But it takes a lot of conversion. All right? It's not just salvation. After salvation, we need to be converted because you can be born again and you're still your normal old self. Wow. All right. That's the reason why Paul was talking a lot about mortifying the members of our body. All right. So, and the way to do it is to go through a form of a conversion that makes you a child. You have to remain a child forever. I've met with people like Pastor Kumuyi. I've met with people like Pastor Adeboye. These people are in their 80s. They remain children. That's one thing I could deduct from them. They, if they are crying to God, if they are praying, they pray like the way they used to pray about 50 years ago. But you know some people, all of a sudden, they just it's just like when your children are growing up and they don't want to be children anymore, they want to be adults. That is what causes friction in the home, that the father is now having trouble with the children. All right, but when children remain children, we won't have any problem. So God, Jesus said, we should be converted and remain like little children. That's the only way to retain either the kingdom of God, longevity in Christ or yeah. whatever, even to even be able to make it to heaven Wonderful. on the last day. You know, the, you talked about some giants in ministry, yeah. like Dr. Kumuyi of the Deeper Christian Life yeah. Ministry. He remains very childish in the way he approaches God and everything. And also, very simple. Yes, and also Pastor Adeboye. Adeboye of the Redeemed Christian Church of God. There's also Dr. Billy Graham. Yeah. And, and I remember reading up, I, I, maybe it was a video, I read something up about him, where he said he had a meeting with some of his leaders in the initial stages of his ministry. And he said to, and they all agreed that there are certain things that can destroy a ministry, money and all those things. And they now worked at a strategy about how to avoid falling into the, yeah, to fall into the trap of the enemy through those things. You've heard about some so-called men of God who have fallen. Like, what, why do you think they lost it? it? It still remains the same factor. It's one of the things that God has taught me since I got born again. God asked me to remain very natural, very transparent, and very sincere. And it takes a child to be like that. Like I have little kids now, and sometimes I just ask them, okay, answer. I have answer, and I've been answer. answer. I want you to tell me because we're going to be going to play football. Who did this? Who did I say, Daddy, I'm the one who did it. <laughs> so that's one of the things that, you know, if people inculcate it into their lives, they won't have any problem. And that is being sincere. For instance, it's very easy not to fall. Wow. You can make it so hard for yourself to fall. Wow. Because the Bible says, confess your fault one to another. For instance, I discover that I used to pray before I can no longer pray. What stops me 
Okay, I'll give you an example. I remember I moved to London many years ago. And I was about 30 years old that time. As at that time, I've never heard about masturbation in my life. I've never had any. Somebody has come to me before telling me they're having problems with masturbation, but I didn't know the meaning. I've never experienced it. I've never known it. I don't even know what they call masturbation. Then a friend who is an evangelist called me and said, yo, you're in London now. You, know, you don't have your wife. You don't have uh, your family over there. You know what they call masturbation. You can start doing it. I, I rebuked the person. I said, get away from me. What sort of nonsense is that? You can't be saying that to me. But a few days later, I started masturbating. Wow. But do you know what delivered me? I just took the whatever was happening to me, I took it to the pulpit to go and tell the people, guys, this is what I'm going through right now. From the moment I started this thing, I thought that it's one of the things that people whose wives are not around used to cuss on themselves. I discovered I'm falling downhill. Can you pray for me? That's the sincerity of a child. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm discussing this on the public, and this is one of the reasons why a lot of young people are attracted to our ministries. I don't hide things from them because what you hide from them is what they secretly do to harm themselves. Wow. <laughs> My, you know, I, I'm just enjoying you. You were talking about transparency and everything. Even in ministry, for instance, your ministry, you gave an example now of you standing there before the whole church telling them what you're going through and you need their prayers. Yeah. What other areas, maybe in the area of finance, and how do you become transparent in all those other areas, your relationship with your wife and all those things? It, it, it has, it's very simple, only that a lot of people get it twisted. For instance, as I was in Nigeria, you know, I was in a program in Nigeria when you called me that I'll be coming here for an interview in London. I've gone to Nigeria to spend the money that I have. I don't have such money. So I put in our workers forum, oh guys, I'll be going to London for, an inter for a TV interview. It has to do with me, with ministry, and with all of you guys. Is there anybody that has some loose money that can buy me a ticket? And I wrote it there. And a couple picked it up and they said, we will, um, we will, we will fund it. Wow. We will buy the ticket and go. Once you know that this thing we do it for Christ, I'm not looking for any personal gain out of it. You can be transparent. Wow. And I tell them, the reason why I'm asking you is that I don't want to touch church money because you already know what we want to use church money for. Wow. <laughs> and I don't have personal money this time around to go. Otherwise, I would have gone on my own. And a number of them, not a couple bought my ticket, two, three other people threw in some hundreds of euro. And they, everybody writing it in the workers' forum. I didn't tell them, oh, save my face. Don't let them know that your pastor doesn't have money. He's asking for money. No, <laughs> don't save my face because Jesus' face was never saved. Hallelujah. When he was thirsty, he told people, I'm thirsty. When he needed to rest, he told people, I need to rest. Wow. Right? If it were to be some of us at this time, we say, no, I have the life of God in me. I don't even, I don't even go to the toilet. No. <laughs> Wow. There is a way sincerity can link you to the power of God. You know, I really thank God for your life because I know, I've heard of some men of God, they need money like that. And they will call the church together. They will use all the gimmicks to raise far more than they even need for the journey. But you see, for your members to support you on that level, yeah. it means that they love you. and They, they, are they so know much. that if anything remains, I will tell them this is what remains. Do we turn it over to the church or do you want to take it back? You mean yeah. the ones that gave you more yes. than you require? Yes, of course. My. Of course. They know me in and out. They know I don't. And because I've discovered that one of the ways to transmit the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ is to be sincere about the dealings of God with you and what you're going through. It transmits the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ more effectively than speaking. You know, some people are watching now and they love what you're saying. So tell us, how, you know, what, how can they connect with you, connect with your church? You know, what do you do? What these are your services, your Bible study? Because if I was in Ireland, to be frank with you, I'll come into your teaching sessions because I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying good. what I'm hearing. Yeah. This, this, what you're sharing to you sounds natural, <laughs> but it's not common within the body of Christ. Yeah, the people in the church know how much we have in the bank account. They know when we want to take money, what we're taking the money for. And they know when we don't want to take money. And we say, no, we don't want to take church money. Does any one of us have loose money? And sometimes I will tell them, okay, I and my wife, we have 1,000 euro we want to put in. Does anybody have? A lot of the time I've done that. It's very normal. And as a matter of fact, this 
uh, kind of style is formulated by the fact that I don't want to get to the gate of heaven and I'm being asked questions that can send me back to hell. Wow. I fear God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. wisdom. I don't want to do anything that will send me to hell. My, the major part of my ministry is going to heaven. I want to make heaven. So how can they locate you? What days are your services? What do you do? We have branches of our churches, uh, of our church in Athlone, in Dublin, in uh, Kide, and we'll have campus fellowship on universities also. But for me, the church is headquartered in Galway. That's Unit 22. Um, Unit 22, uh, Odinway Business Park, Ballybrit, Galway. And you can get me on uh, contact.thepowerhouse at gmail.com yeah. or you can check our website thepowerhouseinternational.org so you apart from your sunday services what other services do we you have, have services on tuesdays and on friday friday is prayers and deliverance service that deliverance service is diy every friday we fast until the prayers are over wow. everybody comes in and we pray over different kind of things and uh, we put it on facebook live also at uh, the Powerhouse International. That's our page Facebook. Do you and do on YouTube also? Do you do counseling? We do counseling. Even for people who are not your members. From everywhere. People come from. You've sent people to me from Northern Ireland before, and from other part of Ireland, and they come around. Praise God. We do counseling for people. Wow. I'm there Monday to Friday, you know, from morning till around 9 p.m. in the office. Wow. You know what? I uh, thank God for your life. And another area I want to push you into is this area of marriage. Yeah. A lot of marriage are under serious attack. And I wonder why. And even within the body of Christ is heaven, even bishops, pastors, <laughs> divorcing their wives, people that call themselves apostles. Yeah. What, what can you say about this? The first thing is that if the foundation be spoiled, if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? That is Psalm 11 verse 3. The foundation of every good marriage is hearing from God. Wow. It's not about the physiological make of a person. All right? It's about what God speaks because faith is an act based on the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. And faith is the factor through which we overcome. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So and faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So the first thing is to know the plan and the purpose of God before you get together. And after getting together, transparency, transparency, transparency. Amen. My wife knows every step that I take. My wife knows who comes to the office to, for counseling. My wife knows where I am. My wife knows what I'm doing. She knows where I am right now. Wow. She knows what I'm doing right now. And if I'm feeling any way, or maybe something is happening in my head, I tell her, I say, this is what I'm feeling in my head. Can we pray together? A lot of the time I've asked my wife, lay your hands upon me. It seems as if I've not been able to read the Bible as I, as I saw in the recent time. It seems as if I've not been able to pray as I saw in the recent time. It seems as if I want to be thinking about girls in the recent time. Please, only pray for me. And apart from praying for me, since she's a minister of the gospel, she sits me down and say, what is it? It's the same thing from her also. She's a scientist and goes to a lot of conferences. So if anything is happening in her heart, she just say, hello, Ifemi. She calls me Ifemi, and I call her That's only. my love. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and she said, this is what I'm feeling. I say, okay, this is how to go about it. This is how to go about it. We are partners in Christ Jesus, making progress on the way to heaven, making progress on the way to accomplishing the plans and the purpose of God on earth. If there is, if you've heard the voice of God before entering into the marriage, and then you're sincere with each other, there will rarely be any problem. Wow. Uh, do you do marriage counseling? I do. What about marriage conferences? Because what you're sharing, the body has to hear clearly. Yeah. A lot of people are struggling in their marriage. Yeah. It, is, it is terrible. The reason why a lot of people are even struggling again is that a lot of people don't know that when they get married, they are still going to struggle in marriage. People think that marriage is a cure for lust. Marriage is not a cure for lust. No. It doesn't, I, agree, I agree with it you. It doesn't cure lust. No. It's decisions to stand against Lord that kills lost. So a lot of people get married maybe to a beautiful lady that they've taught with this lady or to this man, everything will be over. No, that lady is not God. It's not Jesus. It's not an angel. You're going to find a lot of mistakes about this lady. You're going to find a lot of mistakes about this guy. And uh, things are going to be very normal. 
But then, once you're sincere with one another, with whatever troubles you are finding, you'll be able to have a right way. Life is easier than people think. Jesus said, come and learn. He said, come to me, you that labor and heavy lady. I'll give rest. He said, come and learn from me. For me can load in and you'll find rest to your soul. For my yoke is easy, my body is light. When we learn of Jesus, how sincere Jesus was. The Bible says he was tempted in all ways yet without sin. How can, how can God come here and accept or consent to the fact that he was tempted? But Jesus let everybody know he was tempted. Wow. Yes. And when he needed somebody to carry his cross, he said, I can't carry this thing anymore. Somebody should carry it. Wow. <laughs> you know, thank God for your life. Because, you know, in this area of relationship, I, I think we need to do some conferences on marriage. Because like, for instance, I, I, my wife has a book. Yeah. In that book, all my passwords for my account, yeah. for my, uh, my email address, yeah. everything is there. My Facebook, everything, for phone, everything. Yeah. So she's able to just go. And I just leave everything there yeah. because she might want to access one or the other. Yeah. But you know, there are so-called men of God. <laughs> The wives don't have a clue what's yeah, going on in so, there. Just so many people, it's, it's what they have developed from early life before becoming men of God. Because men of God are first of all men, because before they are of God. <laughs> <laughs> God bless you, sir. <laughs> let, let me take you in a, another direction. You know, what can people do to be used of God? Because I see your messages pure, undiluted, and I know that for you to preach that kind of message, you must have had an encounter. You must have fear for God and love for God, like a lot of we ex-Muslims. So what can people do to be used of God? I think it's in Psalm 34, 4, 6, where David said, this poor man cried to God. The Lord heard him and delivered him out of all his troubles. And then in Jeremiah 33, verse 33, he said, call unto me, I will answer you. And so you great. And mighty, mighty things, things which you know not. I'll show you, I'll manifest to you, I'll reveal to you. The only thing is to come to God and cry to him and keep crying to him. One thing, I went back to Nigeria now and I went to the redemption camp, the new place, the new arena that Pastor Deboye is just building. I mean, I just built. It's 30 kilometers by 30 kilometers and they just use it on their special program. This is different from the redemption camp that has become a whole city yeah. on its own. And I discover, and I went by the camp of the deeper life also, and I discover these are people who cry to God, just like the way they have been crying to God since the 60s and the 70s, mm. like a child. Wow. It's an everyday thing. Give us this day our, our daily bread. bread. It's an everyday thing. I cry to God. I've been in ministry for 30 years, like you said now. But I cry to God every day, use me. I don't feel as if I know how to do it. Like I tell people in a church, when I'm coming for Bible study to these people that are young people, I do not know what to say. I've prepared myself. I've known some few things that I will say. How do I say it? Then when I tell them, when I get on the pulpit and they see the way I disseminate the word of God and do exegesis, and they say, no, pastor, you're so bold. Nothing deters you. Nothing, nothing, nothing makes you afraid. I say, it's not true. I lie down hours before I come to the service crying to God, please lay your hands upon me. Mm. Please use me. Make me articulate. Let me be able to convey your mind the way you want me to convey your mind. It's, about, it's all about crying to God. And as we cry to God, this is what happened. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, from verse 19, it says, The foundation of the Lord stands for having this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his. And anyone who is named with Christ to depart from iniquity. Because in a great house, there are not just vessels of honor, but also vessels of dishonor. There are vessels of gold, of silver, of a, of wood, and of stubble. He now says, if any man cleanses himself from all this, he shall be a vessel of honor. Meet and prepare for the master's use. And for every good work. He's been my watchword. When you begin to cry to God, what, because the Holy Ghost, according to uh, chapter 16, and I think for 6 of the book of John, Jesus said, when the spirit of truth shall come, it shall guide you into all the truth. Amen. It shall teach you everything. You see, when you begin to call on God, God begins to speak to you by the Holy Spirit, and God will be telling you what to remove and not what not to remove. Wonderful. And as you take those out of the way, you can be cleansed by God and be prepared meat for the master's use and for every good work. Praise God. Hallelujah. Man of God, we've got about two minutes left. I just want to give you about a minute.
to look in the camera over there, whatever the Lord put in your heart to just bless someone with, maybe you want to pray, you want to share a word of knowledge, whatever you want to do, you're free, sir. What I want to tell somebody who is watching me right now is that there is no hopeless case. Once you can come to God, once you can cry to God, once you can lean on Him, God gives hope to hopeless situation. Anybody can call on God. It doesn't matter the religion in which you find yourself, whether Buddhism, whether Sintoism, whether Sikhism, whether Judaism, whether Christianity, whether Islam. Wherever you may be, whatever you may be passing through, your case is never hopeless. I've been in many cases that people will call very hopeless cases. I was sharing some of them when I was in Nigeria recently, when somebody had to tell me in Lagos in 2003 that maybe I can go back to the village and be farming because everything came crashing down on me. Wife dying, children dying, but I cried to God. Mm. The same year that somebody told me to go back to the village, things changed. I was able to finish, visit 10 countries, 10 different countries that same year without owning any dime at the beginning of the year. And my life changed from that time up until now because I kept calling upon God. I tell people I have only one gift and that is the gift of seeking God, calling upon his name. If there's anybody to call upon God, that's a God to answer. Wow. Man of God, you know, I could, I'll be here with you for hours talking about the kingdom because what you're sharing is very, very refreshing. You. But you know what? Uh, quickly before you go, how, what do how, this, what do you see about the state of the church, the gospel, in the Western world? The Western world has had their own fair share of God moving through them, like moving through the United Kingdom, moving through America to reach the nations of the world. But there comes a time, like the Bible says, Jezreel has waxed fat and it kicks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Zara, I'm saying there's a lot of prosperity, there's a lot of fortune and whatever, and people begin to forget God. The only thing that can revive this place are the people who are hungry for God. God is only attracted to hunger. Wow. And if there are three or four or five people who are hungry for God, they can bring this place back flat on its belly before God, just like the people who did in the in times of past. Praise God. And it reminds me of a guy in the Bible called uh, Enosh. He said, in the days of Enosh, men began to worship God. Yeah. Thank you so much, man of God, for coming. Yeah. And we're looking forward to having you back here again. Thank you, the Lord bless you and yes. prosper you and the work of the ministry. Amazing. Thanks a lot. Bless well, you. on that note, I want to thank you so much for watching us. And I hope and pray you've been able to pick up one or two things that will help you in life and also in ministry as a Christian. So thank you. And like I always say, whatever you do, don't touch that dial. We we'll back your way very very soon and i say same time next week actually bye for now <laughs>